Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity um, to, from the EIF to share some of the work that we've been doing in Dorset um, as a local family offer um, area. Um, I also want to um, reinforce some of the messages I think that Donna's made, and I think you'll hear them over and over again as probably we go through our presentations about the significance of actually getting the system to work um, in a better way so that we actually um, impact on the outcomes of children who are living in circumstances that um, uh, challenge their life chances. Um, we go there. Um, you would have seen this um, diagram, I'm sure. It's from the Institute of Government, and it sort of maps out um, the local... Um, service um, landscape at the local level. Um, it's complex. Um, it's even more complex in an area like, like where I work um, because we're a two-tier authority at the moment. So we have all sorts of services distributed around the different authorities. However, we decided as part of the lo lo local family offer to try and do something around um, the complexity that we see within our areas. Um, and in Dorset, we have developed um, a, a th things called family partnership zones, where we establish um, certain geographies that um, try and bring these services together in a much more um, closely aligned way. Um, each family partnership zone consists of all of those services that, w that potentially impact or interface um, with children. Um, we were very successful in our local um, family offer of actually integrating very well with education um, and we recognise that education is a really important place um, for disclosure um, over things like this and for um, teachers and teaching assistants to be able to identify those issues that often surface through discussions or through behaviour, etc. Um, and we partnered with the uh, partnership, um, Education Partnership Zone in developing a post called a Relationship Navigator. Reiterating the points that Donna made, we actually were on, um, just at the time of um, bidding for a local family offer, um, we undertook a, um, an exercise called My Development Tool, which identified exactly what was, um, Donna um, said, um, in that there was a very, very low level of confidence in the workforce about asking about the quality of um, uh, parental relationships. Um, and we learnt a little bit as we went through that, um, because we did some um, training with um, OnePlus One in Brief Encounter, and we got past the, the point of actually using... Um, technical um, language like I tend to do as an assistant director and a strategic person um, and not ask them how's the quality of your relationship but uh, rather asking how are things at home so simple um, um, messages like that that began to equip the workforce with a, um, greater knowledge skills attitude and behavior that they can actually engage with families and move them on the relationship navigator was a very important part of the, of the landscape of bringing all of this together that anybody could have referred to the relationship navigator for some signposting and for some direct work with families where there was nowhere else for them to go. What we also found was um, that those who were most in need, reiterating your point, um, weren't getting the service that they needed. Um, relates, relates to a particular client group. It doesn't necessarily relate to those who are most in need, most disadvantaged, and who would find that um, help-seeking behaviour more challenging. So that's a little bit about what we did. So I want to talk to you now a little bit about the benefits, um, about why do, it, why do this. Um, whenever I think about something that we're trying to achieve um, in children's services, I always think, what are the benefits for the organisation? And you will know, all of you, the pressure that we're under with regard to um, changing the model, um, finance, etc. But this will, I am absolutely convinced, um, help us manage demand for our services across the piece. Um, it will allow us to release resources into other important areas because we are seeking to resolve some of the issues that families face and then we can focus on those most in need. Um, the organisation then can develop a more graduated approach to how it deals with this and about low intensity, medium intensity and high intensity input and I think um, the Department for Work and Pensions are making a contribution to that. Um, and equally the budget Donna mentioned the £47 um, billion, pounds, um, probably from the same research that I did. So um, just in, in some of the areas where, where I work, £16 billion pounds in health and social care costs, £7 billion in terms of civil and, civil and criminal costs, and £2.5 billion in education and young people's costs, over and above that, which um, is um, tax credits and loan parent benefits, etc. 
But more importantly, um, we have to think about the benefits for people. Um, and it's really important to me and to the people who are working on this agenda in Dorset that it's important that the quality of life for families are, is good. It's equally important that children and young people be the best that they can be. And anything that impedes that, we need to be, um, um, be attacking. Um, improved attainment through attendance. Often parental conflict actually results in poor attendance in school because of a variety of issues, um, be that um, not wanting to leave parents on their own and, and other factors. It will inevitably, if it's, we are successful, lead to less looked after children. Currently in our child protection population, 90% of those have an issue around parental conflict or domestic violence. It's very common. Emotional health and well-being, physical health, parent-child relationship, all the things that Donna said, so I can, from the local um, area, talk in exactly the same language as you are, uh, as you are um, from the more academic um, uh, perspective. The role of parenting style, I think, is really important. The notion of authoritative parenting style rather than avoidant or the other. There's four, four in the box, I can't remember them all. Um, but the role of authoritative parenting style helps people um, achieve for themselves and equally for their children. And if you have a more authoritative parenting style, you are more, more emotionally available for your children. And I could go on. I just want to reiterate that we're very committed in Dorset to um, moving this agenda forward and actually enabling the system, if I go back, no, I can't go back, the system as a whole, that complex system, to work um, in a unified way around a, a unified set of outcomes so that achieving good family stability will actually benefit the children and young people in Dorset. Yes, OK. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alison Priestley. I'm the service manager in Newcastle upon Tyne. And you've already heard this morning about the increasingly compelling evidence about why we need to tackle this issue of interparental conflict that's poorly managed and poorly um, resolved. And I just want to share a little bit with you about our experiences in Newcastle over the last couple of years where we've been involved through the local families offer like, like Dorset um, and some of our experiences have been similar and I just want to kind of share a little bit about the learning and, and the opportunities uh, as well as some of the challenges that we've experienced in starting to address this, this challenging issue. Um, Don has already outlined a lot of the um, evidence about the impact of poorly resolved conflict on children, so I'm not going to, to go over that. Um, but I kind of want to stress that one of our first uh, key things that we learned was parental conflict isn't really a single issue facing families. The families, as Patrick just said, in terms of the issues in Dorset for children in the social care system, it's often a whole range of issues that are, are affecting families, but parental conflict is very much one of them. So that has implications for all agencies. This is not something that is a problem for one service or one agency. It's not something that our domestic violence services need to address on their own. It's not something that the local authority can tackle on its own. There's implications of this for all public services because the costs of tackling this, as we've just heard, are borne right across the whole of the public sector. So there are challenges for all of us and for our partners about how we work together to tackle some of the issues around poorly resolved uh, parental conflict. So in our phase one of the local family offer in Newcastle, when we'd worked with just a relatively small number of families to help identify and start to address some of the challenges they experienced in their parental relationships, we analysed uh, those families, and we, you see there that they were complex families that were accessing a whole range of other support as well, um, through children's social care, through health visiting support, through mental health support. Some of them needed support with drug and alcohol whole use, they were needing support to access the labour market. Um, so quite complex interrelated issues and it needed a multi-agency response. 
So we rapidly realised that and set up a multi-agency steering group in Newcastle to help us try and tackle some of the challenges we experienced together and to share some of the learning from our very first initial experiences in this field. And we quickly realised that the Troubled Families programme, which obviously is a multi-agency programme across the public sector, um, that that was a useful way of helping to disseminate some of our learning. Uh, so we made uh, critical contacts within the Troubled Families Programme Board, getting this on their agenda and ensuring that we were identifying parental conflict as an issue within the Troubled Families Programme through our Family Outcomes form. Some of our early learning um, is a bit of kind of, oh, wow, our but. Um, so there were moments when we really had insights into how we could do this, and then there was the challenge of, oh, okay, it's not quite as simple as maybe we first thought. So one of our first insights was pretty obvious, these are not rocket science, but we realised that health services are really well placed to start to identify families where interparental conflict might be an issue. They're a universal service, they're making contact with lots of families. They're often present in the home, visiting families within their home environment. They're doing an assessment of families' needs, often a whole family assessment. But actually, Patrick uh, touched on this a little bit as well, as did Donna in the research, one of the things we quickly realised is that health staff might feel very confident to ask all sorts of quite intrusive quite personal questions about your health, about your child's development, about your pregnancy, really quite um, intrusive questioning, but they didn't feel comfortable to start talking to parents about their relationship. And that was really interesting learning for us, and I think it goes back to that point on the slide about we still struggle a bit in this country with a sense of this isn't for public discussion, this is a private matter. What happens in the home, what happens between couples, what happens between parents, unless it has a really significant safeguarding impact on children, then actually we don't venture there. So that's one of the things we've got to overcome and, and, and that helped us to think about how we might do that. So it highlighted immediately for us that workforce development was going to be a big need here. We were going to have to not just give the workforce the information about why parental conflict was an issue that all public services needed to address, but we needed to give them some tools. We also started to work more closely with health to think about how we could create a new post within health that might help skill up that workforce in particular. And so we came up with this great idea, similar to other local family offer sites, of a relationship navigator. Somebody that could understand the evidence, understand the services, understand and, and utilise some of the tools that practitioners could use and could help practitioners navigate their way. Uh, well, we had that idea... Um, a year ago, and we just appointed the person last week. So that was the but. Uh, these things are slow. It was difficult to recruit to. Our initial foray didn't actually generate any interest. Again, people were a little bit uncertain about what this was. So it takes time, and it's a, quite a slow process. However compelling the theoretical evidence is, getting the workforce and getting even senior managers in services to think about how they might do things differently, what this means for their budgets, for their service delivery plans, for the way they, they deliver services. There, there's some challenges for us there. We also rapidly realised that we needed easier access to specialist services. It's not just asking the question of families, it's being able to offer them something if they identify that parental conflict is an issue for them. So we commissioned Relate, who were already active in Newcastle and very keen to expand their provision into new areas of, of work for them. Um, but again, and it's already been alluded to, the but was... That sounds easy as well, but there's a whole range of challenges in getting those services that are already established in this field and are working with all kinds of couples um, in this arena, 
But the challenge was about perhaps working in slightly different ways, working with new partners, working in different communities, working with families that perhaps wouldn't be the traditional family that would cross the threshold of Relate. And lots of challenges for them about how you chase up families, how you remind them of appointments, how you follow them up when, when perhaps their experience of the service isn't going too well. Um, and lots of us that work in family services are very familiar with that hand-holding, that encouragement, that reminding, that going back again and again. Oh, you missed your appointment, but it's not too late. We can still do this. But not all services are set up to be able to operate in that way. And so here, I've just wanted to kind of conclude, really, because I've, what I suppose I've tried to share is, as I say, some of the opportunities we have experienced over the last few years and some of the challenges that perhaps we have seen and how we've attempted to overcome those challenges. And we are really excited about this work and about the, the way in which it can give us an opportunity to reshape the way services are delivered in a more whole family way that can work as a multi-agency team addressing a range of issues that families experience. So we're just showing there on the left, you probably can't see the detail, but it's looking at the outcomes for families where parental conflict had been identified as an issue and the things that improved for those families. And so we saw improvements in a whole range of issues. So relationships improved, so that was a good thing, but also actually things like securing a tenancy improved for them. Uh, mental health was shown to be an improvement. Their access to employment improved. So again, there's a whole range of knock-on consequences of, of getting involved in this work. And the graph is just showing the pre and post relate counselling interventions and the scaling of how families felt about a, a range of issues that they'd experienced. Um, so that was our experience in Newcastle. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Those are two great examples of the impact of, um, that this kind of working can have in terms of reducing demands and improving the lives of family and children and the need for that multi-agency approach is certainly something that we've been looking at. And we're publishing today a guide for the health service particularly and how they can engage um, with this agenda. So it's really interesting to hear your remarks about that. And we want to do more work on how you engage disadvantaged families um, in this area. But Chris, can I now hand over to you, Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Chris Martin. I'm the Commissioning Director from Essex County Council. There's going to be lots of echoes, I think, in what I'm going to share with you now. It's the disadvantage of going last. <laughs> um, but, uh, but in some ways, that's a very good thing, isn't it? Because um, if there's some uh, commonalities around from three different parts of the country and from the EIF, it, it must mean that we're um, hitting on the right points. Um, so I'm just going to share with you some of the things that we've uh, found in Essex. Some very obvious things um, through lots of conversations with families and with parents, obviously, in particular. Um, so the impact of unhealthy parental relationships is a very obvious kind of parental uh, and emotional kind of well-being element, uh, and that will have, obviously, a kind of wide range of impact, some of the things that we've discussed already. There's obviously the potential impact around children's social, emotional, behavioural, and particular academic outcomes. So when we talk to young people... Um, the, the issue around kind of parental conflict was one of the things that perhaps on one level way not surprisingly but the amount of times that it was brought to our attention perhaps did surprise us and maybe we were a bit naive in terms of our understanding of that but that surprised us um, then there's the, the the kind of I guess more slightly complex issue around intergenerational behaviours impacting on family stability so the fact that families would share with us their stories and you would begin to see a pattern from generation to generation to generation and I guess the, uh, the, the ability to kind of break some of those patterns um, was difficult, but also in terms of making some positive and impactful change, very important to how we needed to, to think and support families in future. There's the obvious, obvious kind of element around public service demand uh, in terms of local authorities and education, health and, and the police service as well, and around some of those behaviours, particularly with young people, being all symptomatic Again, the point being made earlier on in the background, the issue of kind of parental conflict and difficult parental relationships manifesting themselves in almost symptomatic behaviour, particularly within young people. And then there's the obvious, obvious um, inevitable detrimental economics impact in, ter in terms of kind of people's well-being and their abilities to kind of maintain meaningful employment, etc., etc. Um, 
so what we thought we could do about this was would be to um, focus more strongly around prevention, early intervention. That we thought there was a lack of proactive information, and advice, and guidance on parental relationships, uh, and we were largely reactionary around the kind of domestic abuse space. So we thought that actually these this support needs to be more accessible, and it almost needs to be anticipatory in nature. Um, we thought there was a whole workforce culture, particularly associated around uh, mothers. We don't necessarily ask the right brave questions, and we too often label children as being the problem, whereas the behaviour of children, as I've said before, is almost symptomatic. And we need to encompass much more strongly the role of fathers and men and kind of male role models within the wider extended family. So to have a much more loose and kind of flexible understanding of what a family means. One of the areas that we, we in Essex probably need to focus a little bit more on is around same-sex couples as well. We haven't paid enough attention to that uh, as a, a nuanced area of support that we need to think more closely about. We've got on here service design, so we've heard the kind of thoughts around a multidisciplinary, multi-agency approach. Um, families don't find those services uh, particularly easy to navigate. They're not integrated. They're not accessible at the right times. Some very practical and pragmatic feedback from families for us is that we'd be happy to use the support that you provide. You're just not open at the times when we can access it. You know, we're, we still operate a very traditional Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of model. We had lots of parents coming to us and saying, Dads in particular, actually, who are obviously kind of quite often working mothers at home, saying to us, well, if you're open on Sunday evening, I'm there. But you're not, so I, I can't access what you're providing. Um, and also there was something for us about a traditional <coughs> thought around services. And maybe we need something that isn't so service-orientated. Uh, maybe we need to build more on existing strengths, things that are already there. And the, the really powerful thing that came across to us with families was, was the kind of the power of peer support as well how they valued the inputs and the insights from professionals, but the things that were often most profound were came in the form of actual peer support as well. Uh, a bit around process and practice there. We are often, our practice is mother and child centric, and the point being made around, uh, it's the relationship between the child and the parent, quite often the mother in Essex as well. We need to kind of take a broader view about that. Things that we've done, uh, we've co-produced a kind of healthy relationships and advice and guidance pack. Um, which we've distributed and kind of tries to recognise that those uh, difficult points in relationships need to be recognised earlier and we shouldn't be just responding to crisis. Um, we looked at processes. We've had a recent review of father and dad's research uh, coupled with our own kind of parental relationships work with, with the DWP and that's led to uh, reviewing child and mother-centric processes as I've kind of already mentioned. So we want to kind of be more inclusive and have a broader definition, I guess, of what a parent is and and indeed what, what uh, families consider their own kind of family structures to look like and to be. Um, in terms of service design, as I mentioned, we want to be much more holistic. We want to include dads and men and male role models much more in what we think a family kind of consists of. And that's based, again, upon what families have told us. They've told us that actually you know, they've got a very flexible definition, a very personal definition of what a family is, and we need to kind of pay much more attention to that and be much more... Um, less constricted or prescriptive in terms of our thinking around what family consists of and what, what couples actually consist of in that family. And that whole thing around workforce culture as well, um, we uh, increase the numbers of mums and dads being worked with directly to address their needs, but that point around a relationally kind of capable workforce um, that facilitates parents to accept, accept that their own relationship is the thing that kind of needs to change and shift in terms of addressing some of those, some of those kind of family-based issues. Um, and we recognise that point around the skills and the tools that a workforce need uh, aren't necessarily there. And I think for us in Essex, our feeling was that we, we've lost that a little bit. So one of the things I wanted to share with you, which doesn't necessarily come out so clearly, is that um, we've kind of created a system vision. Of, I wanted to share with you a kind of broader point, I guess, around relationships. We're about a year in to a transformational contract and a partnership between ourselves uh, and Virgin Care and Bernardo's. And we've uh, commissioned what you would traditionally see as health visiting, children's centres and school nursing services. Uh, and in the west of Essex, that also encompasses the community paediatric provision. Those teams are now formed uh, in healthy family teams. So they are kind of multidisciplinary, multi-agency in nature, and they're there to serve a locality. The point I get, wanted to get across to you today was that the issue around relationships, both very specific in terms of couple relationships, but relationships right the way across the system 
are really important to us uh, in terms of that commission, in terms of an approach for public services and local government, and, and, and indeed our colleagues in the NHS, particularly in the west of Essex. There's a real recognition that relationships between couples, relationships within families, relationships across communities, relationships between practitioners, very obviously relationships between frontline practitioners and families are really, really important. And they can be transformational and reparational. But I think for us in Essex, we, and what frontline practitioners tell us is that we've actually lost a bit of that. We've lost a bit of how creative and responsive and how positive that work can be. Uh, and so we, alongside our frontline colleagues, have made a huge commitment. This is a, a kind of a long contract and a long partnership with Virgin Bananas. But ultimately, we think the, the secret lies in creating a much more kind of relationally capable workforce. One that is focused on the kind of minutiae of parental uh, conflict and those relationships, but even at a wider scale, stronger relationships across the system that is there to kind of support families is fundamentally the thing that we need to be focusing on. Yes, we need to do things like parenting programmes. Yes, we need to encompass evidence-based work. But actually, fundamentally, at a kind of conceptual level for us in Essex, that kind of relational capability across a system needs to be strengthened and needs to be recognised. Brilliant. Thank Thanks you. very much. <laughs> yeah, it's really fascinating to hear about the work you're doing with the role of fathers in the family and just different ways of doing things from kind of simple things like opening times to peer support and so on. So thank you. We've got some time now for questions from the audience. Um, I think we've got a couple of um, roving mics um, somewhere. I'm hoping... Yes. Yes, excellent. <laughs> right. so, so please, um, can you say your name and organisation when you want to ask a question um, and, and let us know if it's directed at one of our panellists in particular. And I'm going to take groups of two or three questions at a time. So who would like to kick us off by asking some questions? Great, one here, please. Jambon, Public Health England, South West. This is a question to any of the panel. Um, if you were speaking to a local authority who was thinking about decommissioning some of their parenting services, which is happening in some parts of the country, what would you say to them? Was that decommissioning? Yeah. yeah. And a third question? Uh, yeah, I'm Honor Rhodes and I work for Tavistock Relationships, but I have to declare an interest because I'm also an early intervention foundation trustee, so thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm really interested in that particular conundrum of how hard it is for our workforce to talk about uh, the quality of relationships. And I also still think that we're very good at talking to women about any number of brave things. I still think it's very hard for us, fe very female workforce, to talk to men. So I wonder what it's going to take to be able to have a conversation. I'm interested. I think it's a brilliant idea to have a healthy relationships pack. But how are we just going to have very ordinary, quite tedious conversations about our relationships and make that absolutely ordinary? Because then I can retire. <laughs> very keen on. Thank you, Honor. And I will come back to take another group in a minute. But um, Alison, can I ask you to respond first of all to any or all of those? So about how on earth you find the right families what would you say if people were thinking about decommissioning services and what's it going to take for us to have those kind of honest conversations with people to make them all ordinary? Wow, really good questions. Um, so, I mean, that is absolutely the critical thing. How are we going to find these families? Because if they're not going to tell us that relationships are a challenge because of the, the reasons we heard about waiting until it's got uh, almost too late, and if we're not going to be confident enough to ask them then that is, going to, that is our problem at the moment. We don't know who these families are. I guess in Newcastle, we already have a really well-established way of working with families in communities. We have a model of a community-based family hub, building on our old model of Sure Start Children's Centres. We have lots of staff who are very experienced at engaging with families, including some quite hard-to-reach families. So I do think the key is about skilling up the workforce. We have to give them the confidence, the tools, 
it, it goes back to your point about we have to try and make up this feel like some a conversation that we can just have. Um, and I, I, you know, I think we can, we can do that. Um, I, I think it's just getting over our, our reserve, our reluctance, our nervousness, our anxiety about the answers we might get, as well as just asking the question. Um, but we can do that through some workforce development programmes, and there's now lots more of that going to be going to be co coming available to to local authorities and to, to staff. So that's a really welcome step. Um, in terms of decommissioning services, I mean, it's a challenge, I guess, lots of local authorities are looking at. They see, you know, there are a whole number of budget constraints around this issue. But I guess fundamentally, if this is about people having conversations, then it's not entirely about budgets, it is about mindset. It is about people understanding that where we're very, very good at focusing on the parent-child issues very often, and that's how many of our services are set up to look at the relationship between parents and children, that sort of vertical look, we're less experienced at looking horizontally at the relationships within families between couples <coughs> and parents. Great, thank you. Patrick? Um, I think all, all, of, all, all of these, I think, are connected in some way um, to um, a workforce issue. Um, the... Uh, Use of a wider network of services across a locality I think is really important um, in terms of um, being able to identify those who are going to, most going to benefit from a particular service. And we have to make um, good use of the connections between the voluntary and community sector and those um, organisations <coughs> that sometimes are more, not always, but sometimes are more successful about engaging um, people rather than the, the county council, um, which has a particular um, role to play. Um, in terms of decommissioning, again, this, is, uh, this I think is about workforce development. So in Dorset, we have introduced, and um, we're the first in the world to do it, a programme called Incredible Beginnings, which is um, a programme of work for preschool settings um, that Caroline Webster Stratton has devised. Um, and that is about building the capacity of that workforce to work in a different way, recognising that they're not just there for childcare, but they're there to intervene with families where possible. Um, and have some skills to do that. So I, I would see um, that workforce as well, um, because in Dorset, 99% um, of our three and four year olds take up their free offer, so we know where they are. So we should be engaging with those practitioners in order that they can actually help us on this journey. Um, the, the, the workforce, um, and so that answers the decommissioning um, question really by actually making sure there's capacity within the system to undertake some of the work that we otherwise might think about commissioning. Um, and we've done that by um, uh, parenting programmes and training the trainer around parenting programmes, etc. Um, it's the quality of the relationship, I go back um, to Chris's point really, that I think is the, is the way in which you get to the point where you can ask that question, how are things at home? Um, instead of um, not really um, entering into a conversation at all um, with a parent. It can be relaxed, it can be um, uh, conversational, doesn't need to be staged, um, but just in, in a contact with a family, simply saying, how are things at home, how are the kids, that sort of thing, rather than thinking it's going to be through a structured assessment, um, which um, probably um, will, will focus on some other things other than the quality of that, re that relationship. But I can remember when um, uh, the work program first came out um, and, and social workers and others were particularly reluctant to talk about money, to talk about income. Um, now that's um, they, they do that in they do it in Dorset um, because they know the circumstances that sort of wrap around the family materially impact on, on how they are and I think we'll get to the point where we will talk this language and that conversation will be had more and more often. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, so I'll, to be slightly controversial, those hard to reach families, I, I'm not sure that it's that difficult to find them. Actually. If I so my conversation with my petitions. Your health visitors. If I say to them, give me the 10 families that you're most worried about in your locality, in your community, they actually know what they are. Um, and quite often, if they cross reference them with the, with the families that the children's centres are working, for example, they're quite often the same one. So, you know, we talk about all sorts of things around risk stratification and hard to reach families. I'm not sure that's the case, actually. I think we know those families are. I think what we need to do is give our frontline practitioners some permissions 
and some freedoms and some tools. So I think there are some kind of relational elements in terms of their work that we have lost a little bit. But some permissions to actually work with these families in a way that would be much more beneficial to them. One of the frustrations that um, family centre workers and health visitors tell us, or have shared with me, is that almost kind of arbitrary point in time based around child's age when they have to stop working. And I think, well, because I have to do the mandated checks and because I work in a children's centre and we work with preschool kids and all that sort of stuff, what they actually say is, well, I'd like to kind of see that work through. I'd like to kind of carry on seeing that, that work through. What families tell us is that they use a the children's centre with their, with their preschool children and when they were having some difficulties with their kids when they were seven or eight or nine, they couldn't go back to the centre that they had some confidence in because they only work with preschool. This is madness. So I think it's, I don't, I'm not sure whether there's anything complex around risk stratification or anything like that we need to do. We know these families are. I think we need to operate differently. We need to be completely focused around how we create kind of positive change for them and give our frontline workforce some kind of freedoms and some permissions to get on with it and doing it. And that, I guess, connects to me around the point around commissioning. But be decommissioning or commissioning, you need to base your decisions upon some meaningful conversations with families. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about decommissioning or commissioning. You need to base those decisions upon what's going to be impactful. We should be making decisions around an, un an unrelenting focus around positive impact and outcomes, and actually what the families are telling us. So be it commissioning or decommissioning, that's what that we need to base that decision on. Great, thank you very much. And we've just got time for one more question. There was a hand that was up just around here, just there, thanks. And there'll be plenty more time to ask questions in, in the workshop. I'm Vicky Agnew. Um, I'm with Adolescent Early Help Services in Southwark. Um, and I'm very interested in uh, the idea and a big believer around kind of relationship capacity. Um, and I'm very interested in how um, yourself, Chris, and Essex intend to kind of roll that out within the kind of the workforce development and whether or not it is solely focusing on kind of commissioning particular training um, packages or whether or not you're looking at champions within your own um, kind of county um, because I agree around kind of yes you can have evidence-based programs you can have really good sound parenting programs um, but I'm talking about extending everything out from social workers um, to early help lead professionals, um, so I'd be interested. Uh, so I guess the work that, we've, that I've just uh, shared with you this morning is an extension of the commitment that we made with social work service in essence. So we are, our social work teams are strength based and they undertake relationship based social work and that's been uh, self-evident in terms of the kind of trajectory of improvement that we've seen in the last kind of seven or eight years. And we wanted to extend that kind of learning and that culture further into the kind of edge of care, kind of family support services, and then right down into the stuff that we kind of recently finished through version five. So conceptually, it's an extension of that, that kind of belief. Um, but I guess in answer to your question, I'm going to flip it on its head, really. We, we're interested in stuff that works. So we've got our list of outcomes, not many, 23 plus five in the west of Essex, which is better than 194 KPIs that currently exist beforehand. But these things are kind of really important for us. And what we're saying to the provider is, it's the outcomes that we're focused in. We're not being prescriptive to you about your model. Um, we're not suggesting to you that you operate in a certain way. We're kind of hand in hand with you, so we have a strong alliance between the commission and the provider. So we're not going to play those kind of traditional games around you know, holding the provider's feet to the fire and all that sort of stuff and ban that sort of language. But what we're interested in is what works. And if the provider comes back to us and says, well, actually, so in terms of the, the importance that you're placing around a kind of more relationally capable workforce, and perhaps focusing in on young people and adolescents, uh, you've got some clear outcomes that you need for. So we're going to use these types of programs or this one. But actually, we're going to do something that's generated from our own kind of workforce because we've had lots of conversations <coughs> with families and young people, and they've told us that these things are really important. And therefore, we would we think that a program that encompasses those thoughts and those ideas are going to meet the outcomes that you think are most important. So we're not prescriptive about what it is. Happy to use evidence-based programs, but to a certain extent, with the provider, we're giving them the freedoms to develop whatever kind of works. It has to be legal, it has to be inclusive. There are some principles that we apply, but you know, we're, but we're really pragmatic. We're interested in what works, and we're not kind of prescriptive about you, know, you need to do it this way. Great, thanks very much, Chris, and thanks for such a fascinating discussion. One that I know will continue throughout the morning. So please join me in thanking all of our panelists.